Today is March 20th, 2013. I'm Kimberly Witham at um, Holy Trinity, Trinity Episcopal Church here with Miss Carolyn Horder. Um, I guess we can start, um, state, just state your name and when and where you were born. Okay, I'm Carolyn Horder. I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I uh, lived in Pennsylvania until I was about 34. Married John Horder. We met at Bucknell University when we were students. And we had have to have three sons. My husband has passed away. Um, but then we moved from Pennsylvania to Oklahoma City. And uh, to be part of the, the Cassidy School, which is an Episcopal day school out there. Okay, what um, brought you to Gainesville and Holy Trinity Church? Uh, at the time, uh, my three sons had graduated college and relocated, and my husband had passed away, and one son had relocated here to Gainesville. So I decided to come here. So, and what is, what's his name? His name is Robert Horder. Okay. And um, is he involved in the church? He and his wife, Martha, and my grandchildren, John and Catherine, are members, yes. Okay. Awesome. So um, you heard good things about the church and just wanted to be a part oh, yeah. of it? Right. And we were an Episcopal school, and I've been Episcopalian all my life, so okay. it was logical. Um, I guess you kind of already answered this, this question. What was it about Holy Trinity that made you choose this church over um, other Episcopal churches in Gainesville? Mm -hmm. um, but was it something beyond your son's involvement? Did you see something special here? Yes, in fact, I had gone to other other Episcopal churches in the area, but this one was closest to our family tradition, uh, the music and the the service, the kinds of services I had here, and so I just felt really comfortable here. So and that's that was that's a big deal. My choice. That was in the church. Yep. Okay. Um, what is your involvement in the church? Your role. I am the historiographer, which is a, a position that uh, was kind of created. Um, we've had many histories written of the church, but we've never had an archives before. And so um, I indirectly kind of backed into this job, and uh, now we have an archives. <laughs> so what does that consist of? Well, it's a collection of all the memorabilia of the church. And, you know, to go back, our, the, the, uh, the church, the original church was out there on Main Street where the Masonic Temple is now. And then it was, we relocated to this corner and built a stone church in 1907. But that was burned down mm -hmm. in 1991. So when, when you have that situation where everything kind of disappeared mm -hmm. in terms of your history, then um, it kind of becomes important to start really looking after what we have. Mm -hmm. And so we've, we've gradually put together a collection of pictures and documents that are in those boxes and in this filing cabinet. People keep donating wonderful things, and uh, I'm trying to keep it organized and make use of it for a variety of purposes. Mm -hmm. We're also digitizing gradually, so we have almost as many files, if not more, on the computer than we have in the files. Wow. So, and people make use of it for all different things. This past year we did a, a history of the organ, which we wouldn't have been able to do if we hadn't had the documents and pictures to go to. And uh, I write a, a, a monthly article for the newsletter. So it's, it's, a, it's a resource for the church for whatever publications and things that they need. Mm -hmm. That's nice. So does it consist of um, records or old songbooks? Um, Just about everything that anybody has ever found in their attic or elsewhere that they, that they no longer want. Yes, we have uh, directories. Uh, as I said, we have five different histories that have been written, so I have several copies of those. Mm -hmm. Uh, documents from the various organizations in the church, lots and lots of pictures, things like that. That's really nice. That's good. Um, okay, so what um, programs are in place in the church to serve and nurture the members? Well, we could go on 
for two or three pages if we listed them. You know, <laughs> what what all, are you involved with, or what's most? Important this is it for me. Okay. I mean, it's really where I I work at home and here to try to keep this organized. I have I did serve one year on the vestry, and um, that in a way is what got me into this because. Uh, I had participated in a program called IHN and was staying overnight as an overnight host. Okay. And what does that stand for? Uh, Interfaith Hospitality Network, okay. which is an organization that offers housing to uh, families that uh, need some extra help uh, until they get back on their feet. And so they move around from church to church to church within a network of uh, churches. And they stay for one solid week at one church. And so each night we, you know, someone stays overnight here mm -hmm. with them. And uh, I happened to be sleeping upstairs and I noticed a box, a Xerox type box, <laughs> with a lid askew mm -hmm. and some paper spilling out of it. And on the side it said, do not discard Holy Trinity history. So I asked the rector's warden, and she's in charge of the vestry, I said, Who's looking after the history? And she said, um, well, nobody, really, right now, since George Bentley died, and he's the man who wrote the most recent history that we have. So then a few months later, she called me on the phone and asked if I would allow her to put my name down as the church historian for diocesan records. And so then I kind of gradually had to figure out what to do. <laughs> And uh, I started off by uh, visiting with uh, a member who was participated in this, this project, Pete Vickers is her name. And uh, she gave me lots of names of people and told me a lot about Gainesville and the early history of the church. I only moved here in 93, so I'm a baby compared to a lot of the people uh -huh. who have been here since you know, their, their childhood and mm -hmm. not farther. And, uh, so then I, I did a combination of um, gathering materials from around the church that were in various filing cabinets, and I did the oral histories. Learned The more I learned, the more I discovered we needed to do. Mm -hmm. And I wrote to the, um, the archivist, the historian for the National Cathedral in Washington, and said, where do I start? <laughs> How do I do this? And he was kind enough to send me... Um, several pamphlets that gave me some direction as to what kind of storage uh, equipment to buy, mm -hmm. etc. How to go about everything. How to get it started. Mm -hmm. you know? So I've just been feeling my way along because, you know, by training I'm an English teacher and, uh, and by profession. So what did I know about being a, a historian? <laughs> and there are people who, you know, study this and have degrees in, in archival uh, procedures and so forth. So I'm really an amateur, uh, and that's why I don't call myself a historian, because I am really just a collector of things that have already been written by other people and trying to, trying to organize them. The only history writing that I do is uh, for the newsletter each month okay. and any other documents that we produce for publication. Mm -hmm. And what programs are in place to serve the greater Gainesville community here at the church? We have the Interfaith Hospitality Network that I mentioned, mm -hmm. and the Downtown Ministries is really very significant. That um, offers on Tuesdays and Thursdays an opportunity for uh, people who need special help, whether they're the homeless or whatever, and they can come in here and we help them get driver's license, birth certificates other documents that they might need to help them find employment or to get transportation or what have you. So that is a really big uh, service that we provide to the community. On Sunday mornings, we uh, serve breakfast uh, to anyone who comes in the door at 7 o'clock from 7 to 8. And of course the church is open to uh, people to come to our services at any time. We run a child care center uh, that actually has two um, locations. The infants to one years old, I think it is, infants and toddlers, is here at the church. And then on 16th Avenue, when they leave this age group, 
they go out there until kindergarten through, through age five. And uh, it's one of the two uh, nationally accredited uh, daycare centers in the, in the city. Wow. Baby Gator being the only other one. So you know, those, we're, we're currently planning to merge those two organizations into a building that we're hoping to refurbish up the street. For um, all age groups. For all age for those age groups up up through preschool. Okay. Not not including uh, beyond that. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So that those various projects and our great music programs, I think we're we're in there doing something mm -hmm. uh, pretty significant for the city. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. You spoke actually about the music program being something um kind of lined up with your. Family tradition. Um, would you like okay. to speak more about that? Why it's why you think it's special here? Well, we have excellent music program, uh, and it's traditional in the sense that it's not folk. It's not folk choir music, although we did have a wonderful folk choir here at one point that uh, it served the six o'clock service. We have three services: eight o'clock where where there is no music, mm -hmm. ten thirty that has usual traditional music. And then at six o'clock is, is folk music. Um, but you know, it's organ music, choir, and uh, chanting, and versicles, and so forth that I grew up with as, as a kid, and my children did too. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's where I like to be. Mm -hmm. yeah. And have you seen that um, change in your archiving of um, any of the songbooks or information about music? Have you seen it? Well, we had a, the latter part of the 1800s, we had a vested choir, which was pretty unusual. Mm -hmm. uh, oddly enough, we got the vestments secondhand from a church that I knew in Philadelphia. Oh, wow. <laughs> but uh, when I thought, how serendipity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But at any rate, um, we've always had good music here. We've always had choirs, always had organs, and... Uh, it has, it has been a major commitment always for the people of this church to have good music. Um, as you read through and collected um, the history of the church, what rectors moved the church um, forward in this mission, in its mission of the city, in your opinion? Okay, well, you're asking me to have a photographic memory here. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> Reverend Craig Hill was the one who helped to make sure the 1907 church was built properly. And that was the one that moved us from Main Street to uh, our current location. And uh, when he first arrived, the footings for an entirely different layout of the church were in place already, but it was a, it was a very, it was too ambitious a building. We never would have been able to afford to finish it. Mm -hmm. And he, he realized that and was courageous enough to say, okay, we're going to put that plan away and start over. And the plan that he saw to it, uh, that was executed, finished by the church, lasted until 1991, you know, when, mm -hmm. when it uh, was uh, burned. Um, of course, there's a big gap in there. There were other... Uh, ministers along the way who added to things. Um, a Bernard Campbell comes to mind, a Reverend Stoney kind of saw. Bernard Campbell uh, oversaw the, the uh, building of a, uh, a parish house where a lot of Sunday school uh, buildings or classes took place. And um, then Reverend Stoney kind of saw the church through the Depression and into the war. But post-war, and the, the uh, minister who really uh, served the church the longest 25 years was Earl Page. He was here from 1960 to 1985. And everything grew during that time. Not only Gainesville and the University of Florida, but this church really flourished under him. Wonderful choirs, wonderful Sunday school, outreach programs to the community. And then um, when he left, uh, David Pittman took over. 
and he was here at the time of the fire. So for him, the challenge was to rebuild this church. Mm -hmm. And he and the, the uh, wonderful leaders that were within the community, within the church, uh, built what we have today. So, um, you know, a lot has, has come along. Um, Father Tremaine, who was here uh, briefly, uh, helped to get a lot of our outreach programs started, got us involved in uh, the community uh, in, in uh, ways that were somewhat, he, he jump-started the uh, daycare center, for example, which had really kind of fallen off a little bit um, after the fire. And uh, a second thing that we did that was really uh, groundbreaking to a certain extent uh, was to actually house the homeless one winter, and I couldn't put a date on it right now, um, when it was so freezing cold. We had beds lined up in Page Parish Hall and provided housing for the better part of a really cold week for the people. And that kind of pushed the city into increasing um, some facilities around the city. We haven't done that since, you know, that was a really extreme situation. And then our current rector has really pushed forward with his downtown ministries, getting it organized so that people knew exactly when to come for what services we could possibly offer. And uh, of course we've had this capital campaign that will allow us to let the school to grow. And uh, she's, you know, rejuvenated, rejuvenated a lot of the programs that uh, either had a little seed planted in the past or needed to be revived from uh, other times. But I, I want to stress though, looking at uh, the history that Yes, rectors, but we have had so many strong leaders among the people. We had one man, uh, William Wade Hampton, for example, who served not only the church but also the diocese for many, many years in the early uh, part of the last century, early 1900s and so forth. Uh, we had a man by the name of Ray Phillips who did a great deal to get our Sunday school program going and, and the part of the Sunday school building that is still, that we still use, that the new, the new structures were added to, were, well, the part of the building was named for him, the, the Phillips Education Building. And, um, you know, different, different names like that. Um, and in our current, current group, we have phenomenal people who built this church after the fire. You know, I could give you a list of 25 people that so it's, it's not just rectors, but they, they have to be the leaders. They're the CEOs. There's no doubt about that. But we have had wonderfully strong lay leadership in this church. It's really, when you read the histories, um, that, that stands out. The other thing is, is um, women. Uh, the women of this church prod their husbands <laughs> and get them to do all kinds of things, the, the various women's organizations, and through the years, its names, the names have changed. You know, first it was a women's auxiliary, and then it's the women's this, women's that. Now we have circles, and they're, they're just a phenomenal bunch of women who will do anything, give dinners, create artwork, put on bazaars, and prod their husbands. There's no <laughs> doubt about that. So this is... This is um, quite a community of very dedicated people. Mm -hmm. And it shows in every, as I said, we have five written histories, and every single one of the historians has mentioned the importance of the music program, the involvement with education, or with some sort of outreach to, to the community, and really strong fellowship and um, dedication to the, to the parish by the lay people as well as strong rectors. Uh, Reverend Locke is our 29th rector, and uh, we're about to celebrate our 150th anniversary. That'll be in uh, 2018. Mm -hmm. So 
29 rectors in that period of time, only nine of them stayed five years or more. So there a, was a lot of turnover for a variety of reasons, you know, and um, it's, it's, it's a really demanding position, you know, to, to run a church in the, the modern time, I mean, this, this world today. So. so do you feel like a lot of um, the responsibility for keeping things going came from the lay people because there was such a turnover from rectors? You know, that could be. Whenever there was, and, and some people left, some rectors left, uh, you know, Gainesville was, didn't know things like air conditioning until probably mm -hmm. well into the 50s or the 60s, early 60s. Um, people were sick. Some, one rector only was here for like three months, and then he left for health reasons. So a variety of reasons, but somebody always stepped up mm -hmm. from the church, from the, from the laity. To keep things going until they got the next rector in, you know. Mm -hmm. So it definitely takes a strong laity to keep a church going. There's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. Seems like it would have been so easy for it to fall into disrepair. Oh, lots of times. Mm -hmm. right. I, I look back and, and, and every once in a while I'll think, how did they ever get through that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I can't imagine, I didn't arrive in, in uh, Gainesville until this church was rebuilt. I can't imagine what it was like for those people to stand. In fact, I've, I've interviewed a few, you know, when they said they stood with tears rolling down their faces watching the church burn, you know. So the fact that they didn't just walk away, and they rallied themselves. Uh, one uh, person told me about, a few of them have told me the story about how they, they gathered together the remaining stones and bricks that were left from the church, and they would clean off, you know, the mortar, so that some of the pieces could be reincorporated in this in this building. Mm -hmm. uh, one person wasn't even a member of this church, but she was a grand grandchild of people who went to this church. Saved a, a remnant of a window, and that now hangs out in our Lily Crop reception room. She saved it under her bed for twenty years, and then paid to have it restored for us. So, you know, everything that could be restored was restored. Uh, one of the members took uh, shards from the, the broken stained glass and she incorporated that in her pottery. Mm -hmm. Another person uh, took some of the wood and, and created uh, wood uh, pieces that, you know, could be offered for sale or mm -hmm. for memorabilia. So it's really a, a remarkably resilient group of people who love their church and keep it going all the time. Mm -hmm. So you weren't here um, when the fire happened. You came afterward, correct? Right. I had visited for two, to my son and his wife, two different Christmas Eves, so I knew what the old church looked like. Okay. And then uh, Rob called and said, Mom, I have terrible news. The church is burned. You know, this mm -hmm. was after I'd come home uh, uh, from a visit, you know, in 1991. So, uh, and then I didn't move here until 93 and really didn't become a member here until 98. Okay. So I came in at the tail end of this. The first time I came to church here, I actually worshiped in Page Parish Hall, which is where they set up the church temporarily while they were finishing the, the main church building. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, my, that was really my first uh, sense of uh, going to church here was mm -hmm. in Page Parish Hall. So you you think you still got a sense of the rebuilding and how, um, like you said, how resilient the the members of this church are? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. right. And the support of the community, you know, the Methodist Church up the street uh, allowed us to use their facilities mm -hmm. for. Our, they moved the times of their church service so that we could have church there mm -hmm. the whole time. And I've only learned this from reading. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I didn't experience it. Um, but, you know, so many um, people or organizations within Gainesville allowed us to use facilities. Uh, Thomas Williams Thomas Funeral Home at one point, the University Auditorium. Um, but the Methodist Church really gave us a, a home away from home until we were able to move back in here. And we have a really strong bond with that church. Mm -hmm. uh, we, do it, we do an exchange sort of... Uh, um, gathering 
every year since Reverend Locke's been here. She instituted that. And in the new building, over each portal, is a, an artwork that was created by Ellie Blair, the artist here in town who is a member. One side shows the, uh, the cross and flame, which are the iconographic uh, symbols of the Methodist Church. And on the other side, you have the icons of the Episcopal Church. So, yeah, you know, we're together mm -hmm. in a fellowship. And um, I think that goes to show how important the church is in the community as a whole, yeah. that everyone's willing to step right. up. Very mm -hmm. true, very true. This past year, they were renovating their uh, kitchen. So we allowed them to use our kitchen every Wednesday night for their Wednesday night program, mm -hmm. and they have their Wednesday night program here. And then this fall, when their kitchen had its grand opening, they had, they had a wonderful buffet for us. So it's a very good uh, fellowship between the two churches. Um, How has the fire impacted those whom you interview or read about or interact with? Um, I know you, you said you've heard stories, yeah. but... Well, I, I have two reactions. Some people are kind of stuck in the past, and, and, it is, uh, and it's, under, it's understandable, a very traumatic incident. And so their memories are that everything was better then, you know. And, and I'm sure that is a very, very natural reaction. But they certainly overcame that and were determined to rebuild uh, what, as close as they could, uh, in re replicating the inside of the church. It's basically the same form uh, or layout, except larger and uh, a little mo much more modern. But, you know, they were very, very determined. And I think they're very um, pleased that they've been able to recreate. But there, there's this one, uh, a sense of uh, great loss that I think the older people who really, you know, had built that church, mm -hmm. they still have really fond regretful memories that we lost that church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And of course those of us who weren't here don't know that, that emotion, except vicariously. And uh, so we're equally dedicated to the present uh, mm -hmm. organization and church. So you find some nostalgia? Yeah, among the, the older people. And, and it's, it's quite understandable, for sure. But they didn't let, they didn't wallow in it. They got busy and built a, a new church. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what makes right. a difference, right? Right. Yeah. Well, the church is really the people, you know. The, the building is incidental, and yet uh, it isn't. You have to, you have, to uh, have a place to, to gather. And um, they were such a church within themselves, if you know what I'm saying, that uh, they saw to it that this church, physical church, was rebuilt. Mm -hmm. And that, that spirit keeps going in the intent to expand the school and to move it up the street and to the flower shop. We, ha we, have a, we actually own the square block on which the church sits. So okay. I, all those buildings that you see out on Main Street are really mm -hmm. part of a large complex that, that we uh, own as a piece of real estate. And the, we have this one building on the corner. Uh, that we call the flower shop because it used to be a flower shop. Mm -hmm. But we're going to convert that into a uh, bookstore and uh, a, little, a little shop for, for selling things. You know, we, we always have a Christmas bazaar and people come in and like, like the items that the St. Elizabeth Circle create. But this will be an ongoing yearly, year-round shop that people can, can go and shop. Gift shop is what I'm trying to come up with a word. Mm -hmm. yeah, gift shop. Okay. That's nice. And uh, the wine and cheese shop next door, of course, is a, is a thriving business. And then all those other... Uh, we actually just acquired one final last piece, which was a, a, a house owned uh, by an older woman. And uh, so we, we now have that 
that complex for future development or whatever happens. Mm -hmm. So there's a forward-looking um, vista, I guess, mm -hmm. focus with this church. You know, they're never, they don't let any grass grow under their feet. <laughs> um, what challenges face Holy Trinity if it's to grow and um, fulfill its mission in the community mm -hmm. further? Well, I think it's, it's, if you saw all the stuff with the Pope this week, um, new members, younger members, you know, let, letting, drawing young people in because they're the future of the church. Uh, young families, their children, and making other than a secular world count for, to people, you know. Um, but then because we are a downtown church, I think that uh, Earl Page and Father Pittman and certainly Luann Locke, uh, Gordon Tremaine, Jim Wright, Jeremy Hole, all the, the, the clergy, the current bishops, current national bishops, push for outreach to the needy. And I do think that as a downtown church, that is particularly our, our challenge, you know, not only to serve our own um, members, but um, reaching out to anyone, you know, the college students, uh, visitors, and certainly the, the, the needy here in this city. We're always going to have to step up and do our part um, as, as part of our role in a downtown ministry. And I think all of us, um, and Ron and Jeremy and Luann, um, remind us of that in, in their sermons and in their focus, that um, you know, we, we can't just serve us. We have to be reaching out. Mm -hmm. And so I, I feel a great, great commitment coming from the various organizations, individuals and certainly from the clergy to keep that definition very lively in our in our mission and it's it's not always easy to do funding for that is difficult and um, having people who have the personality to give that kind of outreach is is uh, something that takes uh, organizing and thoughtful caring. So I think they're they're the challenges. If you're going to be a downtown church, then you have to stick your hand out and greet people and pull them in and uh, teach them about love and and at the same time help them to stand on their own two feet. That's, that's the challenge. Mm -hmm. And hopefully um, ignite a little spirit of faith in them uh, as we're doing that. Um, how have you seen the um, church modernize since the rebuilding of um, the actual building here? Oh, the rebuilding? Yes. Because you, you explained how the, the building looks more modern than the old one. Do you think um, the church and its people reflect that in a certain way? I don't know that it really looks more modern as much as it's larger, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and of course, I didn't worship in the older church that much to know. Um, modernizing, of course, we're an Episcopal church, which means that our formation then the way we worship is in keeping with the national church and with the Anglican communion across the world. So I can go to, into church in England or New Zealand or Australia or Canada, and the service is going to be the same. So in some ways, the Episcopal Church doesn't modernize, if you know what I mean. But the prayer book was rewritten in 1979, and that changed the language a little bit. Uh, the hymn book is more inclusive of different kinds of music than what I grew up with. And uh, 
So in that way, um, the more we change, the more we stay the same. We're really founded on tradition, and we protect those traditions to a great extent. But when it comes to ideas, this church is very liberal. Um, I, I have Episcopalian sister in New Jersey. She doesn't like women priests, uh, ideas about who should be married to whom, the, the, the gender issues, very, very confining. And I would say that my uh, years in Philadelphia were very conservative in terms of ideas. This church is very open, very modern, very uh, accepting uh, of anyone the way they are. The diversity is here. The uh, acceptance of uh, race, creed, color, you know, as, as we say every Sunday morning, everyone is welcome at the altar um, and no questions asked. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a strange mix of this conservative tradition that doesn't change, mm -hmm. except for jazzing into music from time to time. Um, to, to uh, you know, that, that very conservative side in, in, in terms of tradition and the scriptures that are read, um, but very, very open and liberal in terms of this particular church and the way we practice the love of Jesus Christ, frankly. So uh, it's, it's, that's comfortable particularly in a college town. I think that's really comfortable. I think we have, we have a fair number of students who come here either singing in our choir or worshiping with us, and I think that that's something that, that draws them to us, that they're, everyone's welcome. So you feel like you prefer the kind of liberal ideas here to the conservative ones you knew back in Philadelphia? Definitely, just... yes, yes. Okay. And I have to uh, bite my tongue and say nothing when I visit older sisters frequently, you know, because there, there is a, uh, I guess it's a reluctance to accept change. Um, what do you feel has been the most important aspect in the rebuilding of the church and the community from when, from 1998, when you started here? What have you seen the most 1998 it was. Um, probably the outreach to the community, I think, is the thing that I notice um, more dramatically. However, I have to always footnote this, that um, I didn't retire until the early 2000, 2001 time, and I was involved in, in various jobs that I had, and so I really didn't get super involved at the church until into the early 2000s, and so I have a relatively short history when it comes to being able to make that kind of a statement, but since I have been doing this work, and I'm down here a couple of times a week, and I see what's going on, it's very definitely... Uh, a constant, um, sometimes it's so busy, I don't know how we do all the things we do in one, one day. The calendar is so jam-packed. And it's either with, uh, you know, an organization here on the church, at the church that has a function going on, or uh, Wednesday night program is something that's new. We didn't used to have that. And if you were around here at 5 o'clock tonight, for example, there would be little children coming in for it angel choir practice, people coming for study groups, people coming for yoga, there's a soup and salad supper tonight, you know, and, and that's just the way it is. The, the uh, administrators and the sextons are putting tables up and down and chairs up and down all the time, moving things around to accommodate the amazing number of activities that go on in a week's time. And... Uh, so lots of program for the members, that's number one. And number two is the coming and going of people from outside the church into this church for one program or another in the course of the week. 
It's a very busy place. This room is not my room. It's a conference room. Conferences are held in here. Meetings are held in here. I have Wednesdays in here. Tuesdays and Thursdays, downtown ministry uses this. Sunday mornings, there are uh, groups that meet in here. So you have to get on the calendar. You have to get on the schedule, you know. And uh, that's healthy. And we're making good use of facilities and, and uh, busy. Um, do you have any specific stories or anecdotes you'd like to share about um, the sense of community you feel either within the church or um, between the church and the city or um, outreach projects? What do you think? Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> uh, okay, I have to think about that. You That's have to fine. put this on pause. <laughs> um, well, for me, that night that we housed the homeless was amazing. Mm -hmm. And I won't say it was a perfect answer because we don't have the facilities for, for example, letting people wash. We didn't have showers for that, you know. So it was a tremendously um, appreciated outreach to people who were freezing on the street. But it was not something we could continue. It defined for us, I think, how far we could go and how far we couldn't go. Mm -hmm. There are things that churches can do and things that we can't because we don't have the facility to do that. Um, but that, that was a very moving experience to, to realize that we were helping in that regard. And, uh, you know, I, I guess that's the one that comes to mind. Mm -hmm. I feel like that event also um, showed kind of the city and people in charge that the need that there was for yeah, more facilities right, right. that and, could handle something like that. Yeah. And frankly, I couldn't tell you exactly what they've done. I, we've, they've done. We have pushed also uh, for extending the number of meals they're allowed to give at St. Francis. We were very active in that last year. Um, and they did... In, I think it was last year or the year before, and they did increase the uh, the number of meals that can be served and so forth. So, you know, you put a little pressure on, on the politicians sometimes and they come up with an answer. Mm -hmm. I really don't know what the answers are that have uh, provided more bedding. I don't know whether they rent, you know, you'd have to ask somebody else about that. I don't know how that happens. But, uh, you know, I, I think that we make our mark and either doing it ourselves or bringing it to the attention of officials who can do it. Mm -hmm. you know, so. mm -hmm. I'm sitting here look, thinking for an anecdote. <laughs> no pressure, just something yeah. you personally feel like you want to share. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting on a Sunday morning I have on occasion participated with what we call street side breakfast and um, it's, there's a regular stream of people who come in here and are fed breakfast every Sunday morning from 7 to 8 and the clergy drop in and you know say a prayer or something, greet them and um, I think there it's very appreciated. The challenge of course, and I don't go to 8 o'clock service so I don't know how many of them stay but I think some do have their faith awakened, you know, by being treated kindly. And uh, definitely with the, uh, the IHN program, uh, you can see some families who, who can turn it around mm -hmm. because for one solid year, they have to be interviewed and accepted into that program. And they have to be either looking for a job uh, going to school to improve their skills so they can get a job. And some of them have two and three kids. And, you know, they've, they've lost their housing, they've lost their footing some way. Mm -hmm. And uh, you'd have to talk to the officials in that organization. But some of those families have completely turned around because they were given a year of not having to worry about where they were going to live mm -hmm. or how they were going to eat. Food was supplied to them, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, housing. 
uh, a place to do their laundry, a place to take a shower. And um, so for an entire year, they didn't have to worry about that. However, imagine picking up your stuff and moving every Sunday afternoon. And that's what they have to do. So it's not easy. But a lot of them go to school. A lot of them go, go to work. And uh, it's, it's really uh, an opportunity to see people who are down and out, and yet they're trying. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it's a good way to uh, help them, mm-hmm. giving, give them a fishing pole, you know, rather than just a fish. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a good program. You get involved with that and see lots of little meaningful things that happen. Mm-hmm. It seems also that it would um, give them stability. And yes. Stuff, to right. not have to worry about something like that, right. you know, bring normalcy almost back. Yeah. Give them a place to start. Right. And things, you know, from a very personal standpoint, has nothing to do with outreach or uh, community. Mm-hmm. Uh, watching my grandchildren grow up in this church and participate in, in Youth Sunday where they get up there. My grandson gave a sermon one son, one son, my granddaughter carries a cross. And, you know, they break, break through things like uh, girl acolytes happened when Catherine was an acolyte. And, you know, that, that's just very thrilling if you're a grandparent to see that, to see your children and your grandchildren continue the tradition, even though that doesn't outreach to the community, and indirectly it does because it's their future, you know, and you hope that that they will have picked up a love of the church and their faith uh, that um, that will mean something all through their lives, you know. So that's that's a thrilling thing for a grandma. Mm-hmm. I can only imagine. Yeah, that's really, really important. Mm-hmm. Is that one of the reasons you wanted to come down here to be closer to them well, as your family? Well, at the time, I have three sons, mm-hmm. and Rob's the oldest. He and Martha were settled, and they had Johnny as a, as a little child. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the time, Catherine was not even here yet. But the other two sons were not married, kind of going job to job, not settled down. Mm-hmm. And uh, as I said, we had um, I had been teaching in Oklahoma City, and... Uh, I was li- after my husband passed away. I was living there by myself, and I'm from Pennsylvania. Kids are all around the country. Mm-hmm. They've ended up in California, Indiana, and Florida. But the other two were not married. So when I decided I need to get back to family and not be out here by myself, I wasn't about to go follow one of the <laughs> wandering sons around, you know. So I, I, I thought, well, I either go back to Pennsylvania. You can't go home again, you know, that story. Uh, or I uh, risk trying somewhere new. And so I decided to come here. No regrets. Good. You're happy with it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very, very great place to live. Yeah. That's so I think I'm ready to wrap it up. Okay. Um, you're welcome to say any last things if you want. Well, I'm just very grateful that, uh, that I met Deborah Hendricks <laughs> and that she got me started on oral histories Mm -hmm. and that your program was willing to do this for us because I think it's a real plus for everybody not not only um, you know I've I've been a teacher so I know what it's like for Mm -hmm. students to have a meaningful assignment Mm -hmm. which I think this has probably been for the people yes and at the same time uh, it's a it's a wonderful opportunity for the members of the church to feel involved in the history and we'll have a wonderful document mm-hmm. that will record far more than I can get mm-hmm. on an individual interview. So it's a real opportunity for us to we're very appreciative. Yeah, well, we're grateful we can yeah. work with you guys. I think it's been good. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Oh no, thank you. Okay.